Yeah, my name is John G. Sutton. Uh, I'm here today to tell you a little bit about my time working as a prison officer and specifically in this video as a hospital officer. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with what a hospital officer does within Her Majesty's Prison Service, uh, I am now going to explain this. Uh, I was employed as a hospital officer at uh, the jail they call Strange Ways Jail in Manchester. It has now been renamed since uh, they knocked it down and bashed it to bits uh, in 1990 uh, when they had a nice little riot there. Yeah, and uh, before that I was working there uh, in, the, in the prison hospital at what was then known as Strange Ways Jail. Yeah. Now, let me tell you a little bit about this. Uh, I obviously started work at, at Strange Ways uh, in 1975. I started uh, and I was employed as a, a discipline officer, uh, otherwise known as a screw. Yeah, you can read a little bit about that in my book, Psychic Screw, which is available on Amazon. It's about how I started in the prison service. I started in the prison service for a job. Having been in the British Army uh, as a non-commissioned officer, serving in uh, Germany in a place called Senilager, when I was uh, working on a weapon called the Honest John, which was a nuclear bomb, actually. Yeah, it was a suicide mission, that. You fired the bomb and kiss your ass goodbye. <laughs> Seriously. Anyway, let me get round to the, uh, the the story about working at Strange Ways. In previous uh, episodes of this uh, visions of what life was like behind the walls as a jailer, I've discussed that, and now I'm going to discuss my work as a hospital officer. Around right about 1981, uh, the start of 82, I uh, went to train uh, as a hospital officer. I applied. To, uh, to be retrained and work as a hospital officer. It was a general nursing uh, practice within the prisons. They did not have anybody from the National Health Service working in the prisons then. It was all done by staff in the prisons who were retrained uh, and uh, given jobs as uh, nurses. We were, in effect, the nursing, the only nursing answers that the staff, that the inmates had and the staff had in the prisons was hospital officers and I was one. Uh, I was sent in early 1992 to uh, HMP Liverpool, which was known as Walton Jail at the time, and uh, I, I retrained there and, and also was uh, seconded to the National Health Service, uh, where I spent some time working in uh, hospitals uh, around the Liverpool area and also at uh, the place called Ashworth which is uh, uh, an institution for the criminally insane at a place called Magull. In fact, uh, when I went into there, uh, one of the inmates came up and said, How are you doing, Mr Sutton? Yeah, I hadn't seen him for a long time. He was uh, a prisoner that uh, I'd met previously at uh, Wormwood Scrubs. Uh, the, the poisoner Graham Young, you know, you know, remembers the, the the murders that he committed. He was working in a, an office and he started to put paraquat poisoning into the tea, and uh, people subsequently lost their hair, turned green, and died. He killed about three or four of them. Uh, I had previously shared a cup of tea with Graham Young before I knew who he was. Seriously, yeah. They have a black sense of humour in the prison service, believe me. So anyway, in early 1982, I went to retrain at HMP Liverpool in the training school there for hospital officers. And the training lasted approximately 12 weeks. That was it. At the end of the 12-week period, you came back, you had a white coat, a stethoscope if you needed it, injecting inmates with uh, anything that they needed, you know, anything that was written up by the doctors. I mean, sometimes they required you to administer what's known as the liquid kosh or largactyl, you know, uh, 
you got some of the big disciplined staff to hold the inmates down and you've got a strange in your upper outer quadrant of the buttocks and pumped it into them and it was by direct you had to do it I mean that was your job I don't think it was very acceptable myself in fact uh, I subsequently uh, submitted the evidence against the Home Office uh, at the trial of the Strange Ways riots where the people were put on trial I went and gave evidence uh, and stipulated that uh, if I had been subjected to that then I too would have smashed the roof off the place and destroyed it. Are you with me? Yeah, so anyway, well, at the end of the 12 weeks period uh, they, believe it or not, they issued me with a certificate. And just to prove that I'm not blowing smoke up your backsides here is that certificate. See that? Home Office Prison Department. There you You got it? It actually says, uh, Home Office Prison Department, J. Sutton, has been examined by a board of medical examiners and has satisfied the board that he is qualified to act as a hospital officer in the prison hospital service, brackets England and Wales, signed on behalf of the Secretary of State, C. P. Honey. Registered number 1424, date of issue 1310-1982. There you are. So, having had the full of 12 weeks ex, uh, training, I went, I went before the Board of Medical Examiners and had to uh, answer certain questions, pass exams, which I had to do, uh, pass exams with the NHS. They were certified by the National Health Service uh, you, from the hospitals that you were seconded to. But, I mean, in the period of 12 weeks, I mean, what can you possibly gain in 12 weeks? I, did what I could, I mean, obviously, and uh, obviously must have satisfied the Board of Examiners that uh, I was uh, able to continue this work. So back to Strange Ways I went, because I had been there working as a jailer, yeah, uh, plodding around the landing, slopping them out, banging them up, dragging them down to D-Wing, locking them up, counting them, banging them up, all the usual stuff, you know. But jailers do, really interesting, if you like counting men and closing doors and locking them if you like that kind of thing anyway I really didn't I, it was driving me nuts so uh, I went and retrained as a hospital officer so coming back to strange ways uh, what, what were your duties well the duties were anybody who reported sick before they actually got to see the doctor they saw you as a, as a hospital officer i.e. me yeah with all my 12 weeks training and uh I saw one hospital officer, this is an old joke, somebody came to him at the clinics, you have clinics on the wing, you know, complaining that they got a headache, and uh, this guy, uh, the hospital officer, got a, an aspirin, put it on a, a band, a little sticking plaster, and stuck it to the man's head, so that, that'll sort it out, you know what I mean, that was the kind of uh, caring, compassionate hospital officer that we had at Strange Ways in 1982, you know. I'm sure that helped him, yeah. But they had padded cells as well, you know, where inmates who kicked off on the landings, uh, they were dragged down screaming, had all the clothes ripped off them, and slung naked into the cell, then you teamed in with a, one of the syringes and gave it to them in the backside. And uh, I tell you what, that knocked you out for a day or two. And uh, if you needed any more, well, you got some more. You know? And uh, the thing was, I mean, when the prison staff, when the discipline staff couldn't really deal with them because they were too violent or mad, and people were, honestly, I mean, they would do, wouldn't you? I mean, if you're locked in a cell with two complete strangers who were defecating, smoking, masturbating, torturing you, uh, buggering you, male rape, you name it, you'd go mad a bit, wouldn't you? I think I would anyway. Well, people did, 
and that's when they ended up meeting the compassionate staff that they knew as hospital officers. Uh, what a misnomer that was. I mean, by the time you'd finished dealing with the hospital officers, you were ready for hospital. <laughs> Yeah, I laugh now, but it was cruel. Yeah, I thought it was cruel. I thought it was disgraceful. And I made f many complaints. There was one member of staff there. I, I won't really want to name him, but he was a, a really big guy. Uh, about six foot five, something like that. They called him Big H. I said I wouldn't name him. Bollocks to it. Yeah, uh, and uh, I don't know what was up with him, but he just didn't like my approach, you know. That I made complaints about things, and he started shouting abuse at me one day. And on the landing, on the hospital wing, you know, shouting abuse. I'm gonna, when I get hold of you, I'm gonna break you in. I'll put you over my all that nonsense, you know. And there were inmates walking about, so I went to the inmates. I said, "Listen, uh, I want a statement from you that you've heard this man threatening me." Yeah, all right. So we wrote it out together. They signed it, name, number, all the rest of it. Their number, the prison number, you know took these statements with my statement and I went to see the governor and I said I want to make a formal complaint about this man who was a like a a, 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 a lieutenant you know a inspector whatever he was senior hospital officer they called him and uh, the governor said well what do you want me to do with this I said I want you to put it on my record my record of service I said, I'm not bothered what you do with him at all. I said, it's your responsibility to provide me with a safe place to work. And one member of your staff has publicly, in front of witnesses, threatened to physically injure me. There's the statements. You can interview the people if you want, but there's their statements. I want you to attach that to my record of service. So in the event that this maniac that you are employing attacks me I can take proceedings and it's down to you because you're the boss get out of my office <laughs> I didn't like that at all you know so whether they attached it to my record I don't know I had seen my record previously but we won't go into that you're not allowed to see your own personal records but through nefarious means I managed to do it yeah, anyway, we won't go into that. So I'm talking to you about being a hospital officer. That's what you were doing. You were effectively part of the control system. Not only were you dealing with people's health and their mental health, you were actually dealing with people who were out of control of the general uh, discipline system. So you were snatching them, speaking to medical officers, and the medical officers would authorise you to inject them with the Largactyl or whatever, or they would stipulate that. But I would never, ever inject anybody with any drugs that I wasn't given a direct order by a qualified doctor, qualified medical officer to do. So in the event that I was in on duty at night on my own, which very often I was, I would be the only uh, medically qualified individual and we're talking about qualified, you've already seen the certificate with full 12 weeks training. Yeah, I'd be the only medical officer on duty at night in the entire strange ways. And at the time we had something like 1,600, 1,700 inmates. Yeah, so I'd be the only medically qualified member of staff on. If somebody kicked up in the night and they needed to be treated, I would always contact the duty medical officer. But I wouldn't do it on my own. I wouldn't phone them directly. I would always insist that the security staff in the security office phone the doctor and listen in and make notes, because we couldn't read recording systems there, make notes about the nature of the conversation. So, And uh, the doctor would give me instructions as to what... Uh, injection I should give or what, what action I should take uh, and that way I was absolutely absolved because I was only following direct instructions from a properly qualified MD, a, a, a medical doctor and uh, that way you were safe. You see what happened, the reason I did that was there was a, a, a death in HMP Liverpool and the doctor denied that he had given the instructions for the inmate to be injected 
because the inmate had a reaction to the uh, to the drug and died. And uh, after that, well, I, and, the, and the officer, the hospital officer that did it, was reprimanded for that. Maybe he was dismissed or whatever. But I was make sure that it wasn't me because I would have security staff listening to what uh, the instructions that I were given, and they would make a note in the incident book. So I could at all times say, at that time, what time was it? 2.15 a.m., uh, Dr. Such and Such a Body was contacted by Hospital Officer Sutton, uh, and the instructions that were received from Dr. Such and Such a Body were this. And that way, I'm, I'm clear, yeah? So that's what you used to do. You get people that are attempting suicide, you know, you get people setting themselves on fire, you're getting people uh, attacking their, their, their cellmates, then when they were opened up, attacking staff. I mean, you'd be surprised, but Strange Ways Prison in the early 80s, at night, there'd be probably about 15 staff on. I mean, that's like 120 to 1 against, you know. So you open the door, you know, you, and you've only got half a dozen staff or whatever on hand. You're, you're, in, for, you're in trouble, you know. Hence, they sent for the hospital staff. And uh, you, you put people into padded cells. That's strip them naked, throw them into padded cells, ring the doctor, get your injection, in you go, out they go. Uh, and uh, one night uh, we had a, a member of staff on. I, I don't really like dropping names, but let, I'll tell you straight. His name was Bob Threader. Yeah, there you go. And he was a senior officer. We came in the morning and uh, checked all the numbers. The numbers all right. Yeah, count, count, count the people. That's what you do. Uh, and we opened one of the padded cells. There was two, two naked men. Two naked men in one padded cell. We said, what's going on here? I said, uh, we ran out of uh, ran out of cells, so I had to t double them up. <laughs> hey, imagine that, yeah? Two naked men, both full of, full of lag to up the jacksy, flat out in this cell, double up, two them up. Uh, that, I mean, what kind of an idiot would do that? Yeah, but he did it. Anyway, hospital staff, generally speaking, they were they were reasonably intelligent men who were doing a very very difficult job. And uh, at one stage, I was the uh, hospital officer in charge of the uh, psychiatric assessment ward, which was a ward in strange ways. It was a standard ward. I mean, obviously, they had people on there who were not there for psychiatric uh, reports. You know, when the courts say, we're going to remand you in custody for psychiatric reports, well, that's where they went. Uh, and I was the officer in charge. One day we had uh, a man come in. He was in a catatonic uh, state. Uh, you know, you know, catatonia. Uh, he wasn't speaking. He wasn't drinking. He wasn't eating. He wasn't doing anything. He wasn't moving. You know, if you got hold of his arm and lifted his arm up, that's where his arm stayed. Sat him on the bed, that's where he stayed, sat on the bed. He, he was catatonic. And uh, in, in the state of catatonia, you know, give it three or four days, you're starting to die. Are you with me? Now, this guy had murdered his, his wife. He was, uh, he'd, he lost the plot. They were watching TV or something, he wanted to turn it over, and apparently she wouldn't let him, so he murdered her, strangled her, laid her on the floor in front of the television, change channels and watch what he wanted to watch anyway they, they found him there you know stationary he was the shock of doing what he did had, had put him into a catatonic state if you only stay there so long then you're dead yeah so they had the psychiatric uh, doctors look at him and they couldn't get anything through to him and i was in the officer in charge of the ward there was about 20 inmates on there uh, so uh, i read his record I had his record, I had access to all the thing. I was completely in charge of the place. So I read his record, and he'd been a senior civil servant, you know, something like a principal uh, officer in the civil service. So he's obviously an educated man. Uh, so I assumed, you know, that uh, there was something in there that I could get through. So I couldn't get through to him speaking to him because he was just sat there motionless. 
So I spoke to the psychiatrist about this, and he said, well, you know, we've got to get him out of this. So I was giving him water, you know, literally opening his mouth and putting water in and helping him to drink it, you know, so he wouldn't die on me immediately. But I had an idea, you see. I thought, this man's an educated man, classical music, very likely. So I had a cassette recorder and some earphones, and I brought some cassettes in from my home and plugged them in, put the earphones on the guy. He was just sat on the edge of his bed, motionless, earphones on that I'd put on, switched it on, played him all, lots of classics, Mozart, Beethoven, uh, went, went through the full list, Rossini, you name it, opera. And then I played him a piece called Bluebeard's Castle by Bella Bartok. And I just put it on. I mean, it's if you've never heard it, it's quite discordant. Are you with me? Uh, Bartok's music. So, anyway, we got about 10 minutes into... Uh, I couldn't hear it, by the way, because it was through the earphones, you know. But we got about 10 minutes into this tape. He suddenly took the earphones off, turned to me, and he said, I can't stand Bella Bartok. <laughs> he was out of it. He'd snapped out of his catatonia. I said, oh, welcome back. Are you all right? He said, I can't listen to that. <laughs> He'd listened to all the rest. So anyway, I wrote all this up in the incident book, you know, to say that this man, and when the psychiatrist came around the next morning, he said, uh, absolutely fantastic. How have you done this? I said, well, I worked it out that this man was educated, likely to like classical music, played him that. He didn't like Bella Bartok. It snapped him out of it. He said, amazing. He said, absolutely brilliant. It was about half past 11 in the morning, quarter to 12. The governor was doing his rounds. My report book from the day before had gone down and the report book. And anyway, I got a call down to the down to the office, the chief's office, the chief officer around the office. We used to call him Swoop. Yes, yeah, so if you're watching this Swoop, that was your name, mate. And you were a complete asshole. So Swoop sent for me, the chief officer. Two principal officers with him. Uh, it says to me, yeah. Uh, Who's this woman you've been writing about? I said, I've been writing about any woman. He said, No, it's in the in your daily report book that you've been playing this prisoner something to do with a somebody called Bella Bartok. Who is it? I said, uh, Yeah, it's a, a Hungarian composer, Bluebeard's Castle. You know, we don't want anything like that in here. These are prisoners, <laughs> complete knobhead. I mean, that's, that was the level of it. I mean, you were there. I mean, in my opinion, if somebody's sick, if somebody's ill, they're ill. Are you with me? They're, they're a patient. Patient first, prisoner second. Not that lot. Prisoner first, and prisoner second, and uh, prisoner third, and bollocks to healing them. Anyway, that guy, he, he was taken away. I believe he was uh, psychiatrically unfit to plead. He, he was practically insane, you know. Lots of them about. One guy had burnt his family to death. He'd living in a council house in, I think it was Harper Hay or somewhere like that in Manchester. He, his neighbours were picking on him. He was obviously a social inadequate. Uh, and to convince the council that his neighbours were threatening him and threatening his life because he wanted to move, he poured petrol through his own front door and set fire to it. Unfortunately, about a week before, the council repainted his all his, all his uh, house, and it caught flames because the, the the paint was still giving off fumes, and it took the whole house within a minute or two and burnt his uh, children to well they weren't burnt to death but they were seriously they were when I, I took him to visit them in uh, in a hospital and they were wrapped up like Egyptian mummies with little tubes coming out of the house these little children. And they all subsequently died. He was screaming and ranting and raving. And I was in that ward. And when I was on duty at night, uh, obviously it was my duty to try and keep them sound and reasonably sane. So I had little art classes. I got the art, uh, I got the teachers who were worked there to come in and do art classes. And I used to do poetry with them. And uh, when I was on duty late at night, I used to read them stories. Seriously, I get them all right. I'd say, right, come on, everybody. You know, it's quarter past eight. We're going to have 15 minutes of story time. And I used to read them. Believe it or not, I did. used to read them Richmond Crompton's Just William stories. All these murderers and mass murderers and child abusers and 
violent men all sat round listening to me read them just William I'll tell you I had a sense of humour and you needed that in there and they needed that because it made them feel human and honestly when I tried all this and did it all I started to get assaulted by staff and I eventually was assaulted I was assaulted a number of times by staff I told you I got threatened by this great big 6 foot 5 inch big H character what I did with that one guy I was on uh, duty at Christmas, it was Christmas Day, and I lived uh, 10, 11 miles away from the prison, so I obviously couldn't do anything with my lunch hour. So I said to him, listen, you've got children that live nearby, you can take my lunch hour too. You have two hours for lunch, go and see your kids at lunchtime. I'll, do, I'll just stay here in charge of the clinic, uh, and uh, you can come back when you've taken my lunch hour and your lunch hour and that way you, you know you can make something of Christmas because obviously I can't and it's too far away and I don't want to go and sit in the club or anything so because he used to go in the club at the time have a beer I didn't you know so anyway I sat, in, I sat in the clinic yeah and I stayed in the clinic all the way through he came back and he was late coming back and he was drunk and, I, and he looked really upset you know and I says to him What's all this about? I said, you've had two hours for your lunch. I took it, you would take it. You went home and saw your kids. I said, you come back, you got a face like a slapped ass. What's the matter? And he jumped over the over the desk. Or well, jumped over the desk and grabbed hold of me by the throat and started strangling me. Well, we were in the clinic. You know, there's gallon bottles of Largactyl and drugs and syringes and all the stuff set out for the medication. I th if I'd started fighting back, and which I could have done, uh, we would have smashed the place to bits. But um, I just protected myself as best I could without starting throwing punches. And he eventually tired himself out and gave up. So I phoned up the duty uh, officer, the duty principal officer, and made a formal complaint about this. Oh, he said, I'll, I'll move him. I said, move him? He's just physically assaulting me. There's all bloody marks on my neck. I can't breathe properly. Oh, it'll be all right. I said, I'll tell you what, it'll be all right. I am going to hospital. So I left and I, and I went to Trafford Hospital at uh, Urmston. Uh, and I went, subsequently I went to see my doctor and he put me off sick for a week because I couldn't, I couldn't swallow. He, he damaged my throat. This maniac. And I tried to help him. Uh, and we, I won't really want to name names, but his name was John Barker, just in case you're watching John Barker, which I doubt it because you were a maniac, so you've no doubt drunk yourself to death by now. Anyway, uh, that was one incident when I was attacked. And the final incident when I was attacked was this uh, guy who'd been the doubling up the cells. He, uh, he started shouting abuse at me because he was like a senior officer. Uh, and I want to see you in my office. I said, uh, if you've got anything to say to me, I'm happy to answer it, but charge me. You know, put me in front of the governor or whatever it is. Charge me with some disciplinary offence. But do not shout abuse at me because I will not accept that. And I went off to go and take charge of the ward again, which was up a flight of stairs. And uh, as I started to go up the stairs, uh, this obviously... I don't know, deranged man, grabbed hold of me by the back of my tunic and started to drag me backwards down the stairs. I had a cup of coffee in my hand. So all I did what anybody else would do, I prevented myself from being hurled down the stairs uh, and whizzed round and smacked him in the snot box. That's your nose, by the way, if you don't know what a snot box is. Uh, knocked him from the middle of the stairs right down to the bottom. Uh, they subsequently suspended me and uh, charged me with assaulting a senior member of staff. But I uh, couldn't take any more. I went to see my doctor, told him what had happened, and uh, off, off I went. And I was never seen back in strange ways again. And here I am today. How long ago is it now? Oh, it's 34 years. Since I've walked through those walls, behind those walls, and I never will again, I don't think. Unless they turn it into a museum, which would be good, uh, then I'd probably go around giving lectures. 
Listen, if you've spent half an hour watching this, My Little Tales from the Dark Side, by John G. Sutton, former hospital officer of Strange Ways, then you've done well, believe me. Sincerely, I hope you never end up in a place like that. But if you do, avoid the hospital office. There aren't any hospital officers now, by the way. Yeah, I gave evidence against the, the government. I wrote for the Guardian newspaper and explained, you know, exactly what was happening and how ridiculous and dangerous it was to put disciplined staff dressed up as nurses in charge of hospital wards. And now the National Health Service run all the medical practitioners within HM prisons. And if I played a little part in enabling that to happen, then my passing has not been in vain. I sincerely hope you've enjoyed this. Thank you very much for listening. My name is John G. Sutton. You can read more about my activities in the Strange Ways prison on, in my book Psychic Screw, available on Amazon. Thank you very much for taking the time to watch this. Bye.